welcome everybody to this evening's presentation. We're very fortunate uh, in having two local residents who have expertise and knowledge in this area who are here to share with us. Uh, our, the first presenter is a Larchmont resident, Ned Benton. Hi, Ned. Uh, Ned is a professor at John Jay College and he is the co-director of the New York Slavery Records Index. And our Mamaronic resident is John Pritz. Uh, he is the Mamaronic Village Historian and he's the co-president of the Mamaronic Historical Society. So thank you um, for joining us. And um, if you have questions as we go along, please type them into the chat. And then um, after the presentation, they will pause and, and be able to respond to as many as possible. So thank you. There we go. John? Welcome everyone. Uh, I, I thought we were going to sort of skip this part of it because of the introductions, but that's okay. okay. Well, Welcome to our program on you know, slavery in the Maranek Township. Uh, we are uh, very excited about uh, presenting this. Uh, we are uh, going to be talking about a lot of different people that lived here. Um, free people and slave, slave, slaves. Um, this is one of the subjects that's sort of dear to uh, Ned's heart. Uh, Ned is, uh, is, is part of the, in, the Slavery Index, uh, co-director of the New York Slavery Records Index um, for New York State. Um, he has been researching this for years and has done a terrific job in terms of um, accessing people that were enslaved here in Mamaroneck. So shall we start? Let's start. All right, well, I, I wanna begin with a brief examination of some images. And um, this is an image from the uh, Scarsdale Library it's in their collection of the marriage of James Fenimore Cooper to Susan DeLancey in 1811. And if you look at it, you'll see that uh, the, the couple is in the middle with the minister and over on the side on the left is um, John Peter DeLancey and his wife. Uh, but I want you to look at the actual picture. This is the mural from Mamaroneck Library, which is the actual original site of this picture. You can go in the library and see it. And if you look carefully, remembering the picture from the collection in, in, that I showed you before, if you look on either side, you'll see that there are some other people in the picture. Um, the artist, I think at the he did this in the WPA, understood that um, Delancey was a slave owner. And so included in the picture on the, on, in the, on the one side, on the uh, left side, there is a, a couple and they are enslaved people. And on the right side, there is a, is a woman who is an enslaved person. And uh, I think this is a kind of, this picture is kind of a, or these two pictures are kind of a metaphor for what we want to do tonight is that we want to help us in our community to, um, to basically, um, in your mind's mural of Mamaroneck history, make space for the enslaved people who were, uh, who, for their sacrifices and their contributions to our, our community. And uh, so we'll be trying to show you what I think in our, our, our representations of the history of Mamaroneck to ourselves, we've left out some of, the, uh, some of the important parts of the story. Now we'll move on to, um, these are actually close-ups of the enslaved people. And, you know, we can speculate as to who they are based upon the records we'll show you later tonight. I mean, this is an 1811 scene and we know of the people who were enslaved in the household of Delancey at that time. 
But let's step back and look at the general history of enslavement of which Mamerinek is a part. In 1525, there's a lot of talk that 1626 was the beginning of enslavement in New York, but in our research, Esteban Gomez was someone who was related to uh, Christopher Columbus's um, explorations. And he did an exploration of the Hudson River, figuring that if he went up the Hudson River, he'd eventually get to China. And uh, it didn't work out pretty much when he got to the Niagara Falls, things got a little complicated. So he came back down and then tried to figure out what he was going to do to make his trip worthwhile. And so what he did was to enslave 58 indigenous people and brought them back to Spain. And he was gonna sell them as to be enslaved in Spain. And um, what happened was the King of Spain was horrified and uh, at that time. And uh, so the King of Spain, um, he, being horrified, he didn't enslave them, but he did place them in various noble families to be the household help, and they never got to come back. Uh, so effectively, they were enslaved. But uh, I would consider those to be the first examples of enslavement in New York. Um, but then we have the Dutch West India Company introducing the slave trade in 1626. And in 1698, we have the first recorded uh, slavery in Mamaroneck Township in a census, and uh, Captain James Mott, William Palmer, Palmer Avenue, and Ann Richbell, Richbell, uh, are recorded as slaveholders. Now, uh, this is a census from 1712 of, of Westchester County, and at that time, uh, there were 84 people in Mamaroneck, nine of whom were enslaved and four of the nine people uh, were children. And so this is another record of enslavement. If people say, well, how do we know? Well, this is a, this is a record. Now we'll move up a hundred years. This is the census of 1790. This is the, um, the United States census. And if you look in the middle of the page, you'll see the word slaves. And that's because in the official government census of 1790, they recorded the number of enslaved persons in each household. So you can see we had 57 enslaved people. And if you look at the names down the left side, you'll see Nathan Palmer and Mary Palmer and Isaac Gidney, um, these are, are names that you will recognize and you'll notice later, one of the reasons you'll recognize the names is because we've named our streets after these people. So now here's another depiction of enslavement that gives you a kind of a relative sense of enslavement in Mamaroneck. Um, you, you can see in some major in slave states like Virginia and North Carolina, and then you can move down and you'll see in red where there are unusual numbers, Brooklyn in 1790 was basically a third enslaved people. It was a basically a plantation and Queens was somewhat like that. But if you went down to the bottom, you see New Rochelle with 12.86% of the population enslaved and Rye with 12.7 um, with, um, um, uh, and Mamaroneck with 12.06. And so we were um, a relatively high percent uh, enslavement uh, community compared to other places in the state, but uh, there were other places which were much more intensively uh, um, enslaving people. Now, here we can look at the number of enslaved people in Mamaroneck over time, and you'll see it goes up from 1698 to 1820. You can see, um, you can see that the peak period was around 1771. And then it goes down to 1,250. 
And that was because the Democrats were in charge and they, no, I'm kidding. It's, um, we, it's, it's an important question how it is that enslavement in Westchester County goes down from 34 through 30 down to 1,250. Uh, was this a good thing or a bad thing? And so let's continue our, our, um, our, our narrative here, our, our chronology, and then consider that question. So we have 1771, the regional Quakers adopt a resolution against enslavement. 1788, slavery trading is starting to be regulated in New York. 1794, the US Congress outlawed slave import and export nationally, but not between the states. And in 1799, finally, we have the act for the gradual abolition of slavery. And you'll hear more about that. Um, and so I'll tell you more about it. But this tells you a little bit of why enslavement went down. In the 1780s, a, a, a New York enslaved person could be sold south for a profit of at least $6,000 if you take the amounts then and, and bring them forward to today. And owners could avoid any state bans on slave trades by disguising purchases as long-term indentures or leases, or frankly, they could just say that the enslaved person ran away. So you had these 3,000 enslaved people and, and many of them were sold south. Um, Free blacks were also victimized. Um, the, um, you, the New York Manumission Society in 1796 alone rescued 33 blacks from schemes where they were captured and, so, and, and to be sold south. Um, and we look and we can see in, in just comparing Westchester County and Suffolk County that they both had this drop and um, you can ask yourself, well, did we free them? Well, no, we didn't because the number of, if we, if we took enslaved people and freed them, the number of enslaved people would go down, the number of free people would go up. Nothing went up. And so we didn't take this, we didn't have the same people and just classify them as being free. Did they go to Canada? We'll tell you more about that, but the answer is no, not enough of them went to Canada, but some did. Um, were they sold south? Well, um, we can go into all of the reasons and I won't go into the detail here, but basically the answer is there's a lot of evidence of it. Here's some evidence that this was happening. These are slave trade records from Louisiana that show people born in New York being exchanged as enslaved people in Louisiana, in the, in the New York Slavery Records Index, we've got 33 records of people in, from New York being sold in Louisiana and the, the, the trades being recorded in the, in the local courthouses. So a, a, one of the major historians of, of, uh, of uh, the history of slavery in New York said, the conclusion is inescapable that the exodus was largely the work of kidnappers and illegal traders who dealt in human misery. And that happened for us, for enslaved people in the Maranek as well. So now I'm gonna turn it over to John, but before we do, I mentioned that you'll notice some of the names. Well, on this slide, you see the Griffins, Griffin Avenue, Delancey's, Delancey Avenue, Monroe, Monroe Avenue, Richbell Road, and the intersection of Palmer and Delancey. These are all big time enslavers in Mamaroneck and they're on the names of our streets. John. And first on our list is John Peter Delancey. Now, uh, Having just done uh, redone the historical society, having redone the uh, burial ground for the Delancey fa family with John Peter Delancey in it, um, he was a British soldier during the Revolutionary War, and after the war, all right, 
not wanting to get persecuted for having fought for the British, he left and went back to England. While he was in England, he attempted to recoup from the British government um, his property, all right, um, his land. And when I say his property, some of the property were slaves. Um, he came back after nine years, having failed to recoup anything, but he did recoup 600 acres of land in Scarsdale and Mamarnik. And in 1792, he built a house there, all right? The Delancey House, we know it. It's now on Palmer, uh, excuse me, Fenimore Road and the, and the Post Road across from Harbor Island. Um, Mike Tripico, Peter Fellows, and myself uh, tried to find the footprint of this house when it was up on the hill, and we succeeded. And the first thing we thought when we saw it was, this is a perfect place to put a house. What a view, all right? You look out over, over Mamarnik Harbor, it's gorgeous. Well, this house was probably built by slaves. Um, slaves were the ones that did the, excuse me, heavy labor, all right? Um, building homes, building barns, building those type of things. Um, now, I can't think of anybody that driving by this home today would ever think in their wildest dreams that that building was built by slaves. Um, it, it, it boggles my mind to think that something as familiar as that was built by slaves. Um, a beautiful reason to, to, to try to save it. Um, you know, when, when Delancey came back, all right, some of the businesses that he was involved with were farming or orchards, but he was not somebody that wanted to become a farmer. He wanted to be a landowner. So what did he need? He started acquiring slaves, reacquiring slaves. And they're the ones that actually worked the land for him. Um, here's a, a record of the people that, the, that were enslaved by the Delancey family, by the John P. Delancey family. Uh, Nancy Pott, Tom Pott, Tom Pott Jr. Um, none of these names are, are familiar to us at all. Um, one of the, the issues that uh, we've got is that the Delancey fortune, if you want to call it that, was made on the backs of his slaves. Um, now, In, in this photograph, right, it's, it's pretty obvious that the, the people that are depicted in this picture were important enough in history, right, to be included in this, this painting, this mural. Um, they were people, they were important. Um, when you when we start seeing some of the uh, some of the the I'll, I'll call I'll call them ads for slaves that have uh, been disappeared that ran away. Um, it's pretty obvious that they're they're people, all right, with families and connections. Now in this case. Sam, all right, he was owned by John Delancey. Uh, this is an 1809 uh, ad, all right. A Negro man named Sam or Simon Woodbeck, just released from state prison. Hmm, I wonder what happened there. 
He is a smart, active fellow, about 38 years, remarkably black, with a lively, pleasant countenance and speaks very quick. Is supposed to have gone to Kinderhook. Now that is a very telling statement. Why? Well, apparently he was bought from Abraham Van Allen from Kinderhook. And you have to think that he had some, excuse me, some kind of connection to Kinderhook, right? What? Did he have a wife? Did he have children? What happened to him? We don't know. We don't know. Now, these are from the family records uh, that basically describe all of the enslaved people that we know of anyway, uh, that the Delanceys had. Um, and if you read it, you read through it, right? You'll see that they're uh, all ages, they're children, they're older people, all right? Um, they have all different kinds of, of uh, jobs, if you will, all right? Um, I, I would say that if you look at the people that they were sold to or bought from, they're all also names from the Maranek. Um, Peter Underhill, Underhill Avenue in, near St. Vito's Church. Um, the Purdies. The Purdies are, are a very well-known black family here in Mamarnik. Um, the Livingstons, all right? The Livingstons were a wealthy family from New York that, you know, were probably friends with John Delancey's father or brother, all right? Um, all of these people went back and forth, um, sold back and forth for depending on what uh, what was needed in a particular household. Now, this is Peter Delancey's father's record. And if you look at it, it says Borough of Westchester. Well, Borough of Westchester isn't Westchester County. It's the uh, it used to be a town of Westchester in Westchester County, but it is now in the Bronx. But if you read through it, all right, you can see the name Palmer, all right? You can see the, the name Palmer twice, Peter Delancey, Bartow, all right, is a Mamaronic name. Um, Hunt is a Mamaronic name. Um, these are all people that are associated buying and selling across, you know, town lines, and it happened all the time. So now, now I'm going to, I'm going to um, talk to you a bit about the Palmers. Um, uh, the, the Palmer farm is basically what is Larchmont Village now. And um, the, the older uh, Palmer had a large farm and eventually split it up for his four sons. And I live on Beach Avenue in Larchmont. So I actually live in the Palmer plantation. And uh, my backyard probably was at some point an orchard that was maintained by enslaved people owned by the Palmers. And so we have here in this slide, lots of evidence that the Palmers, for whom Palmer Avenue is named, um, did, did a lot of slaveholding. Now, um, here we have the, the intersection of Palmer and Delancey, and we have here a map that is showing you basically what is Larchmont now. Um, and it's showing you the, uh, the, the, um, the four in the lower part below the post road is the Palmer's um, uh, four shares of farms. Now you'll also notice that on the other side of the post road, the area that today we think of as the unincorporated area 
was referred to at the time as Rattlesnake Hill and uh, something that we should let the realtors know because it, uh, <laughs> it uh, anyway, that was the, the, uh, the local area, but, uh, but you can see the Palmers um, operated a plantation in what is now Larchmont. Now, here's another one of these, um, this is 1755. It's another one of these British colonial uh, census documents where you've got the British military counting who's who and what's what. And so this is a, uh, a, um, a, um, a, a registry of how many enslaved people there were in, in the township of Mamaroneck and the manor of Scarsdale in 1755. You can see a lot of, uh, you can see the Palmers, you can see the Jidneys, you can see Griffins, you can see um, the Merritts, Allaire. Now we'll go to the next fellow is Peter J. Monroe and you can recognize here the manor house which is the house in, the, in, the, uh, in, in Larchmont Manor that is um, the, um, the, the, it really was when the, when the Palmer Orchard was then bought out and turned into what is Larchmont today and developed, this was a house that was the primary house. And Peter J. Monroe lived there in the early 1800s. Peter J. Monroe was a nephew of John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the United States, and also a, uh, an enslaver. Um, and uh, Peter J. Monroe uh, was an enslaver. He had uh, uh, with his Candace, Charlotte, Nellie. In 1808, the prison records at Newgate Prison, which is what is Austining Sing Sing now, um, Prince Nixon was sentenced for life imprisonment to burglary. And in that period, no one else was sentenced to life imprisonment for burglary. Burglary got you four, five, six years. But this guy who was a, enslaved by Peter J. Monroe got life imprisonment. Uh, Monroe also emancipated Anthony Hopper. So we have a record of that. Now, um, I'm gonna turn it back over to John. Um, he'll take you down to the, um, to the mill. To the mill. <laughs> where the um, where the um, where the Mott family lived. Uh, the Mott family were uh, uh, Quakers, all right, and they owned the mill over. Uh, if, if you know where Red Bridge is, uh, it is that pond there, uh, just up the the stream from that pond is where the mill was, and uh, as Quakers, uh, as as Ned mentioned earlier in 1771. Uh, they basically said that slavery was bad. Uh, didn't really get in the way of the way the Mott family operated, all right, because they did own slaves. Um, two of my favorite characters here are in the picture shown on this page on the top left. And what you're seeing are uh, Banjo Billy on the left, because he made banjos. And banjos, by the way, uh, were uh, first made in Africa. Uh, and to his right is Ginny, his wife. Now, these two individuals raised four generations of the Mott family. Um, sometime during or just prior to the Revolutionary War, these two individuals were given their freedom. They did not leave the family. They stayed with them. And uh, I, I find this so interesting. The Mott family um, have a have, have a book, all right, that is published that we will get into in our next next uh, show um, that details some truly amazing stuff that happened to Banjo Billy and Jenny um, and to the Mott family during the Revolutionary War. Um, now, just to give you an idea of how they operated. Um, 
in a township record from 1811, I have purchased a Joshua Purdy, a Negro man named Andrew, who is about 26 years of age. And he has the promise of a person I brought him of that he should be free at 20 years of age. And as one object I have in view in the purchase was to secure his freedom, I do hereby declare the said Andrew to be a free man from the date era of Amarnik, 15th of May, 1811. The Mots were Quakers. They treated their people well, we think, um, and tried to do the right thing here. Now, Gilbert Budd is a patriot, all right? He, he fought as a colonel in the American Revolution. This plaque um, is actually can be found to, to this day in the town of Mamaroneck Cemetery which is on Mount Pleasant Avenue, right near the train station. But Gilbert Budd was a slave holder, slave owner, and he owned quite a few slaves. Um, he is one of the uh, one of the people that used slavery to build his own financial interests. Um, the first thing I want to say about this particular slide is look how they spell my Marinick. Marinick. I find that kind of funny. Anyway, Jin of Westchester County run away from the subscriber at Marinick in Westchester County, the first day of, of this institution, January, a Nero wench named Jim. Um, in these advertisements, all right, they continually talk about young Negro women as wenches, not as women, not as girls, not as mothers or anything. The term wench was used. Um, it, 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 I find that kind of interesting, all right? And in this one, Peter Alar, and this is from 1790, um, this fellow's name, Jack, Freeman John, he called himself. Um, what makes you think that Jack wanted to be a slave? Because that's what he called himself. Um, He's about 23 years of age, five foot eight, all right? Um, chews a great deal of tobacco, has a quickness in his looks. He's looking around for, <laughs> to try to, to, to make some kind of uh, excuse to run away, and here he does. Now, and this is from the town records. Uh, these are certificates of manumission. What this is, is where a slave was given their freedom. Um, and if you look at the dates, this, are, this pretty much corresponds with the, uh, the law that was passed in New York State to try to get rid of slavery. Um, you could not keep somebody born to a slave as a slave um, for forever, all right? It didn't work that way. Um, one of the things that uh, these particular individuals got, got away from is how to um, not get sold south. These people were actually given their freedom. And if you look again at the, the names, Gilbert Budd, Edward Merritt, uh, Benjamin Griffin, all right, um, Delancey, Bud, Mott, they're all common names here in town, Joseph Haight. Now, this particular one, no, we, we saw this one already. Okay. 
Yeah, but, I guess we, you're right, we did. Yeah. Um, if you look at these maps, right, and this is from 1868 now, um, the names that we saw on the previous slides, all right, are all people that are, not all, but a lot of the names that we saw uh, are slave owners. Not in 1868, but they still lived in Mamaroneck. All right, the Palmers are, 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 are there. The Griffins are there. Uh, the Merritts are there. Um, they're all still present in town. Now, Benjamin Griffin, all right? We were talking earlier about the Delancey House and the Delancey House um, was built by slaves. The home that the Griffins lived in, right, which is on Old White Plains Road, was built originally in the mid 1700s as a salt box, all right, style home. Um, in 1800, the house was added to, all right? The house is, is now, it still exists, is big. Um, the addition was done in 1800 and it was done completely, probably, with slave labor. Um, and the fact that we've got slaves wanting to run away from the Griffins sort of uh, proves that things as a slave, you, you know, people want to be free. They do not want to stay as slaves. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is to move us up because we're gonna run out of time. And so I'm just gonna slip, we have, uh, we have some more, um, um, ads and we can show you where you can see these ads. We have a website of them, um, but I'm going to move right now um, up to an important law that also generates a bunch of records about enslavement in Mamaroneck. Um, the law was the Gradual Emancipation Law in 1798. And um, this was a law that um, it, it was ending slavery, uh, except that it's sort of like the ultimate um, pre-existing condition. It didn't end slavery for you if you were enslaved. It ended enslavement for your children. And so the thrust of this law was when a child was born to an enslaved mother, then the child's name was registered at the town and the records, these records that we're going to look at are in the town clerk's office. Really, you can go into the town clerk's office and they've digitized them, but they have the original. Free. They're really there. And, um, uh, and so basically you register the baby and you, if it's a if it's a female child, it owes you, the child owes you 25 years of labor and then the child's free. If it's a male child, the child owes you 28 years of labor and then uh, 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 it's free. However, the owner has the option of abandoning the child to the town. And this happened only once that I can see here and I'll show you but all across the state, this often happened where the owner said, I don't want to raise this baby because I can't sell this baby in the future. So the law provided that they could simply place the baby as an orphan uh, to the government and then the government would pay to have someone else raise the baby. So here's a list of all of the registrations in the town center. Uh, and once again, you're going to see all of the names over on the side, but these records also show you the name of the mother, the name of the child, the date the child was born, 
And, um, and so they're very, um, you can see um, some of them, I'll show you um, in the next, um, in the next week, uh, we'll show you the, um, um, some of the birth certificate records and what they, what they look like. And so um, we're gonna kind of wind it up now and open it up to questions. Um, well, can I, can I speak about Realm first? Yes. Okay. Um, we have been involved with a group uh, that we've named ourselves Realm, right? Uh, recognizing Enslaved Africans of Mamaronic and Larchmont. Um, Larchmont and Mamaronic, excuse me. Um, we've been meeting for, whoa, close to two years. And... Um, through research, education, civic engagement, the project seeks to honor the history, humanity, and contribution of enslaved men, women, and children who helped build our community. Um, we, rec we want to recognize enslaved individuals. We want to engage the community in creating a memorial to recognize the enslaved people. We want to develop and implement plans for educational programs in conjunction with the memorial, We're, this is one of them. Uh, we want to raise funds for the creation and installation of a permanent memorial. In what manner, shape that's going to take, we don't know yet, or we're, we're, we, we are working on that, all right? But it is something that we are very dedicated to. It is something that we are committed to and uh, want to see happen in some shape or form. I, uh, I didn't mean to, to lose that last slide because we do want to make